Ordinarily, I said, like, we'll go through books of the Bible. So, you know, we'll start at Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and then a year or two later, we finish, you know, at the end of um, chapter 28 and things like that. At the moment, we're going through a foundational series. So we're looking at some of the foundations of the faith, specifically going through a book called 15 Words of Life, looking at 15 New Testament words that <clears throat> uh, as we read our Bibles, we might be reading into the Scriptures, into these words, meanings that are not actually meant in the Bible. Uh, or they're words we don't use these days, and so we don't know what they mean. Or they're words that we use in very different kinds of ways. So what we're doing in these 15 weeks is going through these 15 words, uh, A, to help us read the Bible better, B, to help us understand the character of God, who He is, uh, the nature of the gospel, what it means for us, uh, and also looking at the foundational truths of the faith to ensure that we are building our lives on a firm foundation. And so um, today we're looking at one of the words that I think of all the 15 words is one of the words that is most misused in the wider church community today. One of the most misunderstood words. Um, I mean, many of them are misunderstood. I think this is one of the ones that has led to people despairing because of the misapplication of the word. Uh, it's led to people being, <clears throat> I would say, even, uh, I mean, just treated horribly, actually, by some people. Some of the things, even some of these, some of the stories that I might uh, share today. Uh, the word today we're looking at is faith, and faith is a word I put to you uh, that is again broadly misunderstood in the church and it, especially outside the church. You go to different kinds of churches around the city today and ask them, what does faith mean? You will get varied answers to, to what that is. You ask the average Aussie on the street, most people will probably say something along the lines of, oh yeah, faith, <clears throat> faith is believing something that there's no reason to believe, or an, an irrational belief. Not necessarily irrational as in that you shouldn't believe it, but it's just there's no rational basis. It may be true, it may not be true, uh, but you believe and you have faith in that thing without basis in objective fact. That's probably how most people use it. Uh, some people, especially like towards the more Pentecostal end and then especially in the prosperity gospel end of things, uh, treat faith as if it's some kind of mystical force, like in Star Wars, the force. <clears throat> if you just had enough of this thing, then you can do magical things. It's a magical, mystical force. And you can build up your faith. And if you can just build up your faith enough, don't you know if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could speak to a mountain and it would throw itself into the into the ocean. And so faith is this mystical force. One very well-known prosperity pe preacher says as much. This is a quote. Faith is a spiritual force, a spiritual energy, a spiritual power. It is this forth, force of faith which makes the laws of the spirit world function. There are certain laws governing prosperity revealed in God's word. Faith causes them to function. Now, I, this is actually terrible misreading of faith. So I'm not quoting this to try to promote this. I'm quoting this to show you how misunderstood and even sometimes abusively applied the word faith can be. Because the message is, <clears throat> if that good thing didn't happen to you, it's your fault. Because you just didn't have enough faith. If you could wield this mystical, magical force like I can, if you just had enough faith, that bad thing wouldn't have happened to you. That sickness wouldn't have happened to you. Uh, losing your job, losing that relationship, being horribly treated. Whatever it is, insert negative life experience here that wouldn't have happened to you if you just had enough faith. It is a horrifically crushing misunderstanding of what the word faith is. But I believe that it has seeped into a lot of the Christian, Western Christian understanding of faith. Uh, uh, 
I remember one person, a good friend of mine, telling me after his son died that someone close to him came to him and said, if you just had enough faith, this wouldn't have happened. And if you just had enough faith, you could see your son come back to life now. And I'm like, it's way beyond unhelpful, right? Uh, We need to know what these things mean. Because faith is a phenomenal, like wonderful, wonderful thing. And so we need to know what faith is. We don't know what faith isn't, so that when we come to Scripture, and not especially, but after we've come to Scripture, when we go to our brothers and sisters, uh, biological or otherwise, uh, we can be helpful, not harmful, give life and not a crushing despair. So faith, no, it's not a mystical spiritual force. Faith is not like the force from Star Wars. That's not what faith is. And faith is not some sort of unreasonable, irrational naivety or foolishness or stupidity. It's neither of those things. So what is faith? Well, in the Old Testament, faith is, throughout the OT, uh, a, all about a covenantal relationship. Yahweh, God, created God, who he breathes, he speaks, and Everything that exists comes into existence in obedience to his voice. This God chooses for himself a people and makes a covenant with them. He says, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And faith in the Old Testament is founded, grounded in this covenantal relationship. <clears throat> so that we even have like echoes of, of the usage of this word faith even today. Like we think about marriage. In marriage, if you're faithful to your spouse, it means you are living in that covenantal relationship that you have. The people of God in the Old Testament, they were unfaithful over and over and over again, but God continued to be and has always been faithful. Faith in the Old Testament is grounded in the covenant. Genesis 6 says of Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And in Hebrews 11, it talks about what is this trust? What is this belief? What is this relationship? It is faith. So let me read it for you. Then we'll pray, and we'll really get stuck into faith. What is it? This is what the writer of Hebrews says. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith. He stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring. Even though she was past the age, since since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they, are think- if they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return, but they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able to even raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. All these were approved through their faith, But they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Can you see, if you understand faith as a force, when you read this of Abraham, you're thinking he's applying some sort of mystical force. Or if you're reading it as an irrational, blind trust in something that you don't know to be true, you read into it and go, oh, he went somewhere not knowing where it was. Oh, that's what faith means. Or if it's a mystical force, you read of Sarah, by the power of this 
force. Oh, that's how she was able to do it. What we're going to do is we're going to actually see it's not either of those things. We're going to find out what is faith. What did it mean for people like Abraham to be a person of faith, credited to him as righteousness? What does it mean for us to live by faith? So let's pray, open up our hearts and our minds, and uh, see what God would have for us. And so Father, we want to seek your truth today. We don't want to be naive. We certainly don't want to believe things that are untrue, unhelpful, or, or even destructive. So please help us today to have understanding through your scriptures, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is how Abraham's described in Hebrews 11, by faith, over and over again. By faith, by faith, by faith. Looked forward to the fulfillment of the promises that were to be fulfilled in Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. They were looking forward to this thing. And by faith in God and even looking forward to Jesus, all of these things were accomplished. He, by faith, believed that his son was as good as dead and that his son had been figuratively raised from the dead because he was as good as dead. And so he received his uh, son back by faith. And by faith that all nations will be blessed through his offspring, Jesus. So we're applying the rubric of covenant, the faith in the Old Testament in particular, is the covenantal relationship with God lived out in our trust in God. We actually read back into Scripture and see that it's Abraham's trust in God in the faithfulness of God, in the covenantal relationship, in the promise that God would be faithful to his people always, even when his people were not faithful to God. This is the foundation of faith. It's not only trusting in God. That's not the limit of what faith is. Faith doesn't just equal trust. Otherwise, they could just use the word trust. But trusting in God is central or foundational to faith. We can trust God. Abraham trusted God, didn't know where he was going, but didn't need to because he was in covenantal relationship with God. He trusted in the faithfulness of God that no matter where he went, even to sacrifice his own son, which he didn't end up having to do, he trusted God because God was faithful. We can trust him too. When everything seems dead, we can trust him. We don't understand what's going on around him. We can trust him. While we're waiting, it says Abraham considered himself dead because he was so old. How could someone my age have a kid? Or Sarah as well. It's impossible now, actually. While they're waiting, we can trust him too in our waiting. We can trust him when he, ask, when he asks us to do things that seem crazy or impossible. We can trust him with our family. We can trust him with our things. We can trust him with our future. We can trust him with the future of our kids and our neighbours and the people in our community. We can trust him to keep his promises because he's trustworthy and has been from the very beginning. Even Abraham, way, way, way back in the day, knew of his trustworthiness and he has proven himself trustworthy time and time and time and time again so we can trust him. That is foundation of putting our faith in him is believing that he has chosen us, he's covenanted with us, and he's fulfilled every promise. He is faithful, and so we can trust him. That's the foundation of putting our, our faith in him. This is what Paul says of faith in Galatians 3. He says, you know, those who have faith, these are Abraham's sons. So what he's saying is, if you have faith, you are like Abraham. You're like the seed of Abraham. Abraham had faith, he trusted, had a covenantal relationship with God. If you also have faith, you are like Abraham. Uh, verse 8, Now the Scriptures saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles, that's we non-Jews, by faith, and proclaimed the gospel ahead of time to Abraham, saying that all the nations will be blessed through you. Consequently, those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. And then a little later, before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. So faith is a mystical force. How can it come and how can it be revealed? If faith is a blind, irrational belief, how can it 
come? How can that be revealed? The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. So let's unpack this a little bit. He's saying, now the faith has come, we are no longer under the law. So, which is the shorthand for the Old Testament covenantal relationship with God. Paul's saying we are no longer beholden under guardianship of that law. Now we have relationship with God through Jesus, directly to God, not through a covenant of works, or not our works at least, not our righteousness, not the fulfilling of the law by our own actions, but by the fulfillment of the law that Jesus has done. We're no longer under this law, we're under a new covenant, which is the same covenant but fulfilled in Christ. John says this right in the beginning of uh, the gospel. He says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus. He's not saying the law is bad. He's not saying that well, the law is done now, don't worry about the law. He's saying Jesus fulfilled the law. We used to relate to God under the law. Now we relate to God directly in Christ. Faith was the covenantal relationship with God through the law. Now faith is the covenantal relationship with God directly through God. It's a new way of relating to God through the law fulfilled in Christ. Changes everything about how we read this word faith in Scripture. We don't read into it and go, I've got to muster up Got to, got to gird up my will somehow to try to gain some sort of mystical force. But to understand that our faith is grounded, rooted in a covenantal relationship expressed in our trust of God. An earned trust. He's faithful, he's trustworthy. The longer we read as, as uh, we have less reason to believe. So if, you, if faith is <clears throat> having no reason to believe, then the more reason we have to believe, the less faith we think we have. Uh, it's kind of self-defeating. The more you see God at work, the more you trust in him. Oh my goodness, I don't, I don't have any of this kind of irrational faith anymore because I have reason to believe God. It's self, that's a self-defeating kind of faith and no faith at all. No, faith is our union with God in Christ expressed in our trust of him. That's the foundation of faith. Consider Romans 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, by Jesus' finished work, fulfillment of the law, through his choosing us and including us and uniting us to him, expressed in our trusting in him, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've also obtained access through him by faith into the grace in which we stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. How can we boast in the hope of the glory of God? How do we have peace with God through our faith? If our faith, we've got to muster up somehow. Or if it's always kind of varying like this, going up and down with how we feel. If it's not grounded, rooted, established in Christ's finished work and in him choosing us and a covenantal relationship shown as being faithful from all of human history and even in our own lives over and over and over and over again. If, we, if that is our faith, if that's the basis of our faith, then we have confidence we have peace in God through Jesus. It's not irrational. It's not ungrounded. It's not a mystical force. It is rationally grounded in the consistency, in the trustworthiness, in the faithfulness of God over time. And it's lived out, it's expressed in us in trust of God. So when we say the righteous will live by faith, which a couple of New Testament authors quote out of Habakkuk in the Old Testament, <clears throat> saying we live by faith means we live grounded in our covenantal relationship with God. For the law fulfilled in Jesus, 
a new way of relating with God, not just through Christ, but in Christ, lived out or expressed in us trusting God with every step. Whether we are confident that we know what the future holds or whether we're confident we have no idea what the future holds, our confidence isn't in our knowledge of the future. Our confidence is in God himself. So we can go and step in and be obedient in everything. Gupta, who authored the book we've been going through, he said, faith is Christ alive in me. This is what it looks like. This is the, the effect and the effect of faith. <clears throat> faith is the state of dependence on Jesus. Like we heard last week, Chris preached out of John 15. Jesus is the vine where the branches. It's us being united in Christ. Again, it's just another picture of this covenantal relationship of being grounded, rooted in him. That he is the source. And because we are united, we are attached, we are one with him. And to the degree that we are one with him and sourced from him, we have life. We're alive only in our union with him. Drawing life from him, bearing fruit sourced from him. And if we're ever separated from him, what happens to branches when they're separated? They become kindling, dead, dry. They're useful, but only for fire. To have faith, Krypto also says, is to live by faith, which means that we're putting these things into practice. Yesterday, um, my daughter had a party with some of her school friends, which was really fun. I had a great time. Uh, she wanted a Pikachu and princess party. And so uh, I intended to dress up as Pikachu. We've got one of those inflatable Pikachus. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it's got a little battery-powered air pump thing. Uh, my kids didn't let me wear it because they really wanted to wear it. And it was only when the thing is plugged into this battery that Pikachu has life. As soon as it started to deflate, the kids around, these six-year-old girls, they got savage with this poor kid in the Pikachu suit. It started like bashing him and beating him. Uh, that's beside the point. Um, it started to deflate. The life went out of it immediately. Immediately. A uh, small picture of, we've got to be plugged into the source, man. It's the only, only thing that gives us life. To have faith is to live by faith. We need to stay in the vine. Not only can we not bear fruit apart from the vine, we have life apart from the vine. Faith believes the impossible is possible by God's grace and power. Again, grace grounded in the covenantal relationship with God. God has chosen you. He said, I will be your God. You will be my people. He is faithful. And we can trust in him. And we trust in him. We look back at how he's operated, even in creation, that nothing is too great for him. Again, this being who breathes and the expanse of the universe begins. When we consider, again, just the expansiveness of the universe. Uh, it's, too, it's too great for us, perhaps, to consider. Just consider the world. And that he, he speaks in the things that we know come into existence. That he sustains our life with that breath. Uh, nothing is impossible for this God. When he says he's going to do something, or that he says he has done something, means we can absolutely trust him. Absolutely trust in him. This is sometimes the, the limit of what some people think faith is, like God doing the impossible. And so we believe that God can do the impossible and that's what faith is. It's certainly a part of faith. It's not the limit of faith. It's not all that faith is, but it is a part of what faith is, that God does the impossible. We look at a situation and we think there's no hope. This is impossible. This relationship is too far gone, this person is too far gone. Uh, nothing is impossible with God. Because we have a new relationship with God, because we, we, we are united with him in Christ, 
because we trust him, we believe he can do things we don't have a natural reason to believe. That's not all faith is, but that is a part of faith. Romans 1 <clears throat> tells us faith leads to obedience. So trust, how do we exercise trust when it comes to God? Exercising trust means we do what he says. If we trust God and he says, this is what is good for you. These are my requirements for you. This is my plan for you. If we trust him, it means we can do the things that he tells us to do. We can, we can do, not do the things that he tells us not to do. Even when we don't understand those things, we do them because we can trust him. Trusting God means we believe he knows what he's doing. When we don't act in obedience, we are declaring with our activity, with our lives, uh, we don't trust you, God. We don't think you know what you're doing. Or we don't think you have our best interests at heart. Because if we believe he does know what he's doing, and if we believe that he loves us, we can trust everything he says. We can believe everything he says and then activate that belief in our lives by obeying what he says. I don't know if you remember back, um, back in the day when GPS navigation in cars was brand new and the news reports came over, you know, a, a, a lot of news reports saying, oh, this driver followed the GPS and landed in a river. Uh, this, this driver followed the GPS's directions and ended up in the middle of a field. Uh, this GPS follower driver ended up in a lake somewhere and their car's totaled or whatever. Uh, that's, that's believing somebody and following them uh, and that GPS proved to be not trustworthy in the time. For us, God is always trustworthy. And sometimes even when we do end up in a field and God has directed us there, he has us there for his purposes. Or when we turn directly into suffering, where it's not suffering out of, you know, we've made bad decisions or whatever, when we're following God into suffering, we can trust God that our suffering will be for our good. And I'm talking, even if that leads to us dying, that if God has us traveling that path, he has even conquered death. Our view of God, our trust in him, goes beyond our own life. When you trust in God, when you exercise your faith, you exercise your dependence upon and union with Jesus. You can do what he says, even when it seems strange or uncomfortable or costly. We can do it. We can do it. In this case, the object of our faith, God is perfect. He does know what he's doing. He, we can trust him. He does love us. He is working all things out for our good. We, we trust him. Therefore, we can confidently Obey him. He's demonstrated this over and over and over again in history. He's demonstrated this over and over and over again in our lives. He's demonstrated his faithfulness, his trustworthiness over and over and over again in our community. Uh, we can trust. He has shown us his faithfulness and his love most starkly on the cross of Christ. If we ever doubt his faithfulness, we just look to Jesus. We can trust him. We can follow him. And lastly for today, this is not, again, like every, all of these words, this is not the exhaustive coverage of these words. It's to peel back some misunderstandings, some misapplications, so we can read Scripture better, so we can apply it in our lives, so we can understand God better. Faith, if faith doesn't result in love, it's not faith. If the source is love, the fruit will be love. If we're in the vine, with the branches, the source is love, the fruit will be love. This is what Paul writes to the Galatians. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law, you're alienated from Christ. This is the old covenant. You can't do it. You can't do it. You have fallen from grace, he tells them. For we eagerly await through the Spirit by faith, by our covenantal relationship with God, uh, rooted in our union with Christ and his finished work, 
exercised in our trust and lived out in our obedience, the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. So we have a new way, new way of relating to God, not by the law, but by faith. The hope of righteousness in Christ that results in love. It comes from love, results in love. Paul says it's circumcision, so the sign of the old covenant, nor uncircumcision, so not by works in any kind of sense, either way, accomplishes anything. Only faith accomplishes things. That leads to love. The outcome is love. So that God's covenantal relationship with his people, union with God in Christ, expressed in trust, lived out in obedience, results in love. That's the goal. The goal is that we would be image bearers of God. Uh, that our, our lives would be like flags waving, showing the love of God showing the righteousness of God in our obedience, which is our faith on display, faith in action. Uh, we show when things are good, when things suck. We show our trust in God through all of those things. And in every way, when we're living in faith, the outcome will be love, putting our love on display. This is what Paul says matters. And so, if the righteous will live by faith, uh, Gupta writes in another book, he says, the faith invisibly operates as the mode of engagement or orientation towards God. So this is, this is how we live by faith. Again, not a magical, mystical force, not an irrational, baseless belief. It is deeply rooted in God's covenant relationship with us. He's chosen us. He saved us. He loves us. He is trustworthy, and so we put our trust in him. I really like this description of faith from him. It's, faith is a gift from God. He, he gives it to us. He chooses us. It's Christ alive in me, believing the impossible is possible by God's grace and power, demonstrated in obedience and resulting in love. If we would read faith in scriptures in this way, we would have a, we would be free actually from trying to muster up some sort of will. It's liberating to know what faith really is. To know when you prayed and that thing didn't happen, it's not, it might have been your fault, it might have been from bad decisions, uh, but it might not have been from your lack of faith. But God steers us into easy times and difficult times for our good and for his glory. We can trust him in all the times. He makes the rain fall and the sun shine on the wicked and on the righteous. And we put our trust in him and we put it on display with our obedience. And it results in love. This is faith. We want to be a people of faith. We are a people of faith. We're a, we are a faith community. When we say we're a faith community, that's what we mean. It's liberating. It's wonderful. We can encourage each other in our faith, in our trust of God, in our acknowledgement of who he is, in our understanding of what he's done and what it means for us, in our seeing him be faithful over and over and over and over again, and we just trust in his faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these wonderful truths. that our faith is a gift from you. And because of our covenantal relationship and our union with you in Christ and through Christ, we've received your grace, the wonderful gift of salvation, righteousness, newness of life. It's not something we've got to try to muster up. It's something you've gifted to us. And so help us as we are reading the scriptures, to not read in with our old understanding or with a worldly understanding or an incomplete, or certainly not with a destructive understanding, but help us to have 
a true understanding of what faith is, what it means for us, and Lord, help us to trust in you. You are so trustworthy. You are, you've been faithful all the time. You're faithful in our lives, faithful in love, faithful in working things out for our good, faithful for, in building us up into the likeness of your son. We're so thankful that you're faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to you, even when we don't trust you, even when we think we know better, or we think you don't love us, or we think you don't know. Forgive us. Help us to trust in you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.